Thanks so much for being here. Um, there's looks like there's a couple of people who are new to Brain Club. So hi, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong. And this is Brain Club. Um, what I will do is share screen and orient you to our conversation. Okay, so this is our second ever monthly book chat on unmasking autism by Dr. Devin Price. And uh, don't worry if you've not read the book, we were expecting that no one read the book. If you read the book, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the book. Otherwise, this is the kind of thing that uh, we don't expect to like get of you. So we're just gonna have a good conversation um, inspired loosely by the themes of this book. Um, uh, by a way of introduction, um, uh, as, 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 as many of you have figured out already, all forms of participation are okay here. You can have your video on or off, and if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. We certainly don't expect you to look at the camera. We don't, um, you know, walk, move, stim, fidget, eat, all the things, and everyone is welcome here, people of all ages, which, um, of course, um, influences uh, the discretion we must take in the language that we use and the details of things that we share. So um, other than that, all communication is okay. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat box. You can communicate however you're most comfortable. And um, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important to us as part of neuroinclusive space that we are um, uh, uh, respecting and honoring, protecting one another's access needs. And we'll talk more about that on the next slide. But first, I'll just say as a reminder, today is for education purposes only. This is not medical advice. And um, individual traumatic experiences are best processed in a therapeutic setting, of which this is not. So our community advisory board um, uh, uh, met last week and um, we had a gr great conversation around how do we cue safety in community programs and how do we um, negotiate um, access needs and sometimes conflicting access needs, not just a brain club, but like everything we do. Um, so access needs, um, uh, if you're if you're if you're if you're new to brain club, um, that when I what I mean by that term is access needs being anything that anyone needs to fully and meaningfully participate in whatever they're doing, and uh, we all have access needs, um, and sometimes those conflict. Often those conflict, and we talk about that at Brain Club like every week. Um, but um, what we try to do at our community programs is in order to cue safety for people with a broad range of communication related access needs, we want to be able to account for giving space and time. So um, we, we, we may pause to let something sink in. We may pause um, for giving people, you know, extra, extra processing time. We want to create space for people who, and by the way, like you do not need to directly communicate during Brain Club ever. That is never expected of you. And if you want to, we want it to be safe and comfortable for you to do that either in the chat box or with, 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 with mouth words. Um, so what that, sometimes when the conversation goes so quickly and like ping ponging all over the place, sometimes it's hard to insert yourself into conversation. And that actually comes up in this book. Um, so anyway, so and uh, there's also, of course, the 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 uh, perception of time and attention challenges that make it hard where like I have the kind of brain like right now, like I've probably been speaking for five minutes without taking a break. And that is um, longer than probably was the needed for the essence to do so. So we want to um, as a as a facilitator, I may from time to time kind of move conversation along, especially if other people have their hands up and stuff like that. So just to, to name that. Last bit of access. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. Depending on your version of Zoom, you can click live transcript CC. Or if that's not an option, you can choose the more dot, dot, dot and choose show subtitles or hide subtitles, turn it off. Okay, so Unmasking Autism by Dr. Devin Price. 
the gist um, is to be uh, presenting the concept of the mask. And actually, we're actually going to play a video clip um, listening to Dr. Price actually describe what masking is in just a minute. Um, but essentially, it is the involuntary kind of automatic protection that evolves um, that is very common for neurodivergent people and, and, and other marginalized people. Um, uh, 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 essentially, when life gives messages that say that the way you authentically are is broken and wrong, you often evolve adaptations to stay safe. And that that is, for many people, how masking begins. And then he goes on to describe the unmasking process. And first to even ask, is it safe to unmask? And for many people, it is not safe to unmask or it is not always safe to unmask. And in many ways, um, when we think about all of the many aspects of identity, all of the many ways in which people are marginalized and othered, and we think about the, you know, the intersectionality of those experiences, when we think about, you know, the more marginalized you are, um, the less safe it is to unmask in many environments. And so um, I, I wanted to say that up front um, because I think that um, while, while people tonight may be talking about experiences of unmasking, that is not a, you know, a foregone conclusion. That may not even be the goal. That may not actually be the, the right thing to do until we establish safety within community of people who get it, who are safe bucket people, as my six-year-old would say. Um, and then, of course, um, I'll, I'll, uh, and we'll get into some of some 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 of what um, the author describes as the process of unmasking. So, Lizzie, are you ready to play the video clip? Yep. Cool. So did you do the checkbox for sound? That's the worst part. Faking smiles and laughter, um, faking whatever the socially appropriate emotion in any given scenario seems to be, even if we don't understand why people are feeling the way that they seem to be feeling. Forcing ourselves to make eye contact or developing a system such as looking at someone between the eyebrows. Conversational scripting. So memorizing kind of routine uh, interactions uh, based on what we've seen from others or what we've memorized from TV or movies um, or practicing conversations alone in the bathroom or something like that. Pretending to understand a social situation that doesn't make any sense to us, maybe just imitating what everyone else is doing. Intense agreeableness. Um, so just kind of going with the flow or going along with whatever's asked of us so that we don't uh, fulfill that cold, stubborn, uh, unhelpful autistic stereotype. Intense inhibition and shyness because we don't know what the right thing to say is, or we've often said the wrong thing in the past. Uh, drinking, drug use, self-harm, uh, eating disordered behaviors, and social isolation as ways of managing sensory overwhelm. Um, so just trying to blunt how intensely painful uh, the world is using substances and other sources of um, stimulation. Intense privacy and withdrawal because we don't feel safe um, around others because we've been rejected a lot in the past. Leaning really heavily into whatever socially prized traits we do have. So really making our, our identities into being smart or um, you know, being helpful to others or whatever it is that we've been told that we're pretty adept at. Um, or science and math, if we are those kinds of autistics. 
Uh, many of us choose freelance work instead of conventional nine to five workplaces. I say choose, but often it's just out of necessity um, because office environments or customer service environments are really fast paced, loud, bright, noisy, overstimulating. Um, and there's a lot of social work and emotional work that you have to do that's really draining. So many of us instead have to take up consulting um, or are underemployed because we just can't um, can't hack it in a neurotypical um, workplace um, because there's just so much being demanded of us. And these are just a, a, a sample platter, again, of some of the masking strategies people use. Um, and we know that masking is associated with burnout. Um, it is associated with Okay, so let me take that back over. Okay, so what we heard, oops, there we go. Okay, oops. What we heard is that there are many strategies um, for for coping with that message of it is not, oops, I keep leaning on my keyboard. Um, it is not okay. You are not okay to show up the way that you authentically are. Um, there's a, 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 a part of the book that prompts some reflection on what does your mask protect you from? And invites the question of recalling a time early in life when you felt intense embarrassment or shame. And often it's memories like that that stimulate the layers of the mask that stack up over time. And then what many people describe, I'd stop sharing, there you go. Um, what many people describe is that that mask is reinforced. People get positive feedback sometimes for their mask. And that is another layer of trauma for many people. It's a question in the chat. Kelly says, I was curious based on what he said, do you think that intoxication is a type of mask? Absolutely. Um, as, a, as a more quote, acceptable way to, 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 to show up. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And when we think that neurodivergent people are more likely to struggle with substances, um, this all this, this is all a very common association. Um, I wonder, and I'm just actually, Sarah, can, with the rest of that clip, um, is, 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 does, does Devin Price go into specific detail or does he just make a mention? Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to watch it again. All right. No, then we're not going to play the rest of the video. Okay. Um, okay. So, He, he also describes masking as an overcorrection. So the idea of um, even as you know, young children, we get these messages um, of what it is bad to be. I was, you know, I was taught it was bad to be arrogant. So I had to pretend to be humble. And I did this by pretending I didn't know the answers to questions, keeping silent when people said things that weren't true. Um, softening statements with like, well, maybe, I wonder if, I'm, I'm giggling because uh, the Aubrey's Belong staff, uh, we, we, in our culture of interdependence, we had to, we, we, we had to write some emails with some intentional softening of language last night. Um, Christina says, oh, sorry, Kat says first, um, regarding masking strategies people use, strategies employ choice. Yeah, the word strategies um, right, but we're really talking involuntary 
um, not a choice. Yeah. Um, um, and so let's so let's 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 talk about that because um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Christina says I think it depends too about substances, social interactions, or alone. Sometimes if others are intoxicated around you, um, neurodivergent people can unmask because it's interpreted as as though you were intoxicated um, when really you were just showing up authentically. Yeah. Let's scroll back. Let's scroll back up to Kat's point about the involuntary nature of the mask. Anybody have thoughts about that? Hi, Sarah. Hi. Yeah, I was going to say that I think that it becomes involuntary because when you're a child, it's a coping mechanism. So it kind of just gets adapted into your psyche as, you know, uh, it becomes such a strong part of your identity as a child because you don't even realize that it is a coping mechanism. It's just what you needed to do to get through that situation. So I feel like it kind of, it, it becomes an unconscious thing. And it's not until you start to unlearn and unpack that you're like, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's not serving me well. Absolutely. And one of the examples um, that Devin Price gives in the I was taught it was bad to be bucket is like I was taught it was bad to be sensitive. And so, you know, I had to pretend to be the opposite of that by not voicing my needs, feeling ashamed whenever I wanted to express my emotions or felt like that I had emotions to express and fighting internally with every disruptive emotion felt. Christina says in the chat, I can't remember when I did not mask, but I think I was never really good at it. Stevie says, I've done it for five decades now, so I am unsure what the mask is and isn't. Oh yes, Laura. We have a crying kid, um, but I'm. It's making me wonder about the difference between like a skill that you choose to use versus something out of survival that you have to use. So maybe it is a strategy, but it's one you're forced to use, so it isn't a choice. Yeah, um, I, I I agree, and you know, so 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 cat is um uh, uh you know questioning the use of the word pretending. Because pretending um, is in implying that it is like a volitional strategy. Like I am going to pretend. Like I'm going to pretend I'm Santa Claus. Like I don't know that that. I mean, it, it's it's a uh, you know a more neutral like a like a, a some other language. I had to be X. I was told it was this, and I had to be this. Um, as opposed to like, I'm going to make the choice to like try on this character. I mean, there are maybe some, um, you know, theatrics involved of like showing up as a character that you're emulating or something. Like, I think, I think there are maybe some aspects of that, but like the traumatic parts of, of this, these, I mean, these are trauma responses. They're in, involuntary trauma responses. Um, Kelly says, I never fully realized that masking was happening. I just knew it helped avoid uncomfortable situations. It, however, also put me in uncomfortable situations. If I put on a mask of others around me that may not have been the best or safest people for me, right? And I think that, you know, for example, um, one, one common, you know, strategy, right, is, is people pleasing, fawning for survival, for safety. Um, and that 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 often results in really unsafe situations. Christina says, well, sometimes I can choose to, but it's like when I intentionally mask, it's like an alternative personality, right? That's like, that's one flavor of that. Um, and then there's the, like the, the, like the deep rooted, like, I don't know who I am because as Sarah said, from early on in life, I got these, you know, I, I, I couldn't be myself. And so I've, I have this, you know, this disconnection from, from my identity. I don't even know what my identity is. And like, you know, when I think back to like how I started thinking about, uh, cause you know, Luna has the kind of brain that like really learns 
top down, like she has to know something's a thing before she can think about the thing. And so that's one of her access needs, a cognitive access need. So unless you're talking about true self and like the true self of different characters, you know, who's the, who's the true self of like Elsa from Frozen or something. Anyway, true self is like, what do I like? What do I dislike? Who are my people? What do I enjoy like what do I play what do I you know what are what are what are my interests where where am I where do I feel safe where I belong and for so many people they don't they actually don't know those things um because those things were not only not valued but they were actively shamed um I Elizabeth says, I, I think my need to be humorous evolved as a mask, right? It's, it, and that, that, that might be, you know, a variant of fawning behavior. If I make everyone laugh thing, if I make everyone laugh, that in some ways keeps me safer. You're making me it's, think of something, Mel, actually. It's like, yeah. and everybody talking, actually, is making me think of something, like a concept. Because masking is such a broad term, but there's like, how I feel like what people are saying and how I feel about it is like, there's sort of like external masking and internal masking. And what I mean like that is like, when I want to, when I'm in, in work mode or I have to like in a professional environment, like kind of put on a little bit of a show to like get people to like kind of work with me better. It's like a performance. So it's like, it's more like, like an external mask, but the internal masking is more like, like avoiding my feelings or, or in stuff like that. Um, like tr trying to not feel uncomfortable in certain situations so that it, it's like, kind of like a double layer. So peeling off of both of those things to get, you have to get to like, to, to not be masked. It's really challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Ab absolutely. I mean, you're really talking about the difference between, um, you know, sometimes people use the the term code switching or just like you're you're making a choice to say like it's not that like my innate social skills are broken or defective. It's just I I I am actually going to make a choice to like say something in a way that is, um, you know, uh, directed at reaching my audience. Hi, Amy. Hi, Wesley. Weston, sorry, hi. Go um, for it. I think I might have forgotten what I was going to say. But, um, I think the thing, what, what was interesting for me as a child is like, I knew from a really early age that I had to hide myself. And so I think the mass became um, about this sort of internal world. But I think the other thing that happened as a result of it is like, I... I think, which is like a trauma response, which is like, I felt like there was a lot of chaos and I was overstimulated. And so I thought like, oh, if I take care of everyone in my house and make sure everyone else is regulated, then there'll be space for me. And it just took me to like two years ago to realize like, that's never going to work. Um, but I think the interesting thing was I read Devin's price prior to being diagnosed and was like finding myself. And then I like the last couple of days was listening to it again and it was interesting because even his description around things was really assertive in my experience around like what it is and what it isn't. And it was kind of a cool difference because in the beginning, when I first read it, if I didn't have the experience, I'd be like in terror. Like I'd almost be, oh, do I have to mask as like an autistic person? Because I think I really knew I was autistic, but reading it again, realizing like, oh, I have such a closer relationship to what my mask is and when I need to use it and when I the distinction around like cortically overriding as a way as survival versus like trying to fit in and just this, the subtleties of the mask and how complex that can be for individuals. Um, and um, just like the process of being able to have the conversation and the, uh, having a space where everybody gets to have their own experience, including their mask. And so I think it's really cool to have a conversation where I think that there's importance to have, I think, new discoveries and dynamics and like assertions around what things are not, 
but it's also super cool to like even be able to undo that within ourselves of like oh I still get to because I think there's an assertion around like autistic people are from like think from bottom up and here you tonight are saying Mel no like Luna is like a top down and so it's like we get to have our own experience even within that and so I feel excited to have be here with everybody tonight awesome thank you Amy Laura and then I'm going to catch up with the chat Mel, I need you to unpack thoughts for me because they're coming out really rocky and rough here. Um, I'm thinking about empathy and I'm thinking about the double empathy problem. And what you're saying about masking is making me think of how extremely empathetic autistic people need to be to be able to effectively mask. So being able to read your audience and display what you think your audience wants to see is often how we capture empathy. And it also probably makes it harder to have that double empathy problem resolved because if you have a mask up, people have no way of really being able to see what your own needs are and and reflect back what, what you're looking for from that encounter, if that makes sense. It's almost like you have been really thinking about the internal aspects of the autistic experience or something. That's what Laura does for a living. Um, so so um, no, no, I mean, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yes, all of that. Um, just like just some jargon busting though for um, you know, the double empathy problem um is a a, to a term, a toim, a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who's an autistic social scientist in the UK, um, um, from 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, that 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 research that looked at communication between autistic people versus communication um, between neurotypical versus, or, you know, non-autistic versus autistic people. And it's, it was the mismatch of communication style and worldview that explained breakdowns. It was not, it was, it was really disproving the idea that there were like normal com social communication skills. And then us out here who doesn't have them. And and yes, and yet, and yet, Laura, think about how how harmful the stereotypes are. I mean, there's so many things that are harmful about stereotypes, but the stereotypes about, you know, about, about autistic people lacking empathy. Like, I have so much empathy, it hurts. Um, and that's the case for so many autistic people. Um, so I, I, I think about empathy as like a sensory system. I think it's energy. I think if you're porous to energy and it's all coming in, I mean, you can call it empathy, but whatever, whatever words land for you, um, that is responsible for so much dysregulation. Um, so, so yes, I'm reading in the chat, um, Lauren says, I find it harder to mask now how has it changed for others? Um, and I, I, I want to open that up because that is a very interesting topic. Um, I can say that one of the things that go that 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 even though um, uh, we're saying that the involuntary masking that is not consciously like I make a choice to do this, there is still a certain amount of high level cortical functioning required. The executive functioning required for impulse control, even if you're not like, hmm, you know, I could stim or hop or whatever, and like, I'm going to override that. That actually takes brain power, like a lot of it. And so as people are plunging deeper and deeper into autistic burnout, where that state of physical and emotional exhaustion stacked up from decades of capacity being exceeded by demands. And often um, when people reach profound levels of autistic burnout, they actually lose the ability to mask. It's not that they like get fed up and they're like, oh, I'm going to stick it out and show up. Like there's this chapter of this book about like showing up, you know, radical, I forget the term. I'm like the worst facilitator of a book chat any, ever. Anyway, um, but um, so so just the idea of like, it's, it's not necessarily like an I'm done. I'm ready to show up authentically and radically me. It's like, I don't know. My executive function doesn't work anymore. And I can't mask. And that's how I got my autism diagnosis. 
Um, that and I think that's the case for 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 a lot of people. I'm wondering, has anyone else had the experience of over time um, losing the quote ability, um, even though it's something that we're saying is, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have to have this ability or this practice at or whatever. Has any, it's, it's, we're really, autistic burnout is a state of loss of skills. Capacity is exceeded by demands, resulting in such profound exhaustion and loss of skills. And to the extent that we're saying that there's some element of executive functioning skills involved in a mask, that's why I'm saying those things I think are, are linked. Anyone else had that experience or different experiences, anything? Amy? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly what happened. Like I was explaining earlier, like I was so hidden to the outside world that like my house would be a complete wreck or you know the 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 symptoms of not having executive functioning but how i pr appeared professionally or how i appeared like even in my family i wouldn't let anyone in my house and um when when the autistic burnout goes got i mean it had been just building and building over years but when it got so bad it's like i couldn't hide myself from people anymore and i was never a person who flipped my lid and um at one point i had like uh, just like 20 loads of laundry and I had like ants all and throughout my house and I just like it was just kind of a disaster for me and I could had no energy to do anything and my sister showed up with my niece and I I basically like started swearing at them and yelling at them and it was like this moment of like I have no ability to hide this anymore and my sister was like thank goodness was like I don't care like I am no I am staying like I am like doing your laundry with you today like and so it was like a moment for me but it was like it broke completely open this mask that was so hidden to myself even you know and to have done that in front of my niece which was like completely uncharacteristic of me um just like started turning everything around you know it was like I need help and I need like a lot of help and um, so thanks for asking all because it's like something I get you get to share very often or like people would understand. And um, it's like it's like it's like saying God and like humility, humiliating all at once, you know, um, because it's just like you thought you were holding it all together and um, the appearance like it's like this shell just kind of cracks. And I, there was no going back after that for me you know, so. Thanks. Thank you for sharing that, right? And so I think, you know, and, and just modeling the vulnerability of like, you know, just, I, mean, I think for so many people, there's so much, um, I think they, I think people think that they're the only ones who completely lose it. I lose it all the time. And it was really only after starting to talk about that and then hearing like, oh yeah, oh yeah, you too, right? So it's like this, like this, like hidden secret. Um, and I'm sorry for not noticing who was first, Kelly versus Kim. Kim, you want to go first? Sure. Hi. This is only my second brain club, so I'm glad to be here. Yay! Um, but this, uh, this is definitely a, a topic that resonated with me because I burned out four years ago and I lost the ability to small talk. Like I just woke up one day and I couldn't do it, you know? And I, I lost the ability to um, like go to a restaurant and not be overwhelmed by noise it had never happened to me before. And it was really disorienting. It was, it was, it was scary. If, if my, if I hadn't known, if I hadn't read extensively about autistic burnout because my kid had been through it, I would have been even more scared. But fortunately I'd been um, hyper-focusing on learning about autism for a long time. So I learned really quick what was going on, but to kind of be in the middle of it was a lot. It, I, and I still, like I lost a lot of skills um, and I still haven't gotten a lot of them back. I'm still like really bad at masking and small talking now. So I don't even try as much just because even though it's been four years and I'm kind of learning about myself, I, the skills just haven't come back. That's how kind of devastating burnout has been, but I'm figuring out, I guess, a new way to, to be who I am that's much healthier. And it's, 
it's wild that it's taken, you know, 40 plus years to realize that I have to learn to do this. But it's really great to hear other people who are, you know, in the same boat. Because it is very, when you're going through that and not knowing what's going on, and it's much worse to be going through that alone than to find other people who are all of a sudden going through the same thing. Amen. I mean, so much of this is like when you, when you go it alone and the shame and isolation and like all of it, it just makes it so much worse. And so you are not alone. None of us are alone. We're all navigating this, 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 this thing, this thing that like, and I think as Amy said, it's like you, you, you have this, perf- you know, you have these painful experiences that, that sometimes are the thing that allow you to zoom out and be like, nah, uh not safe, not happening, not anymore. Kelly? Yeah, so I think my experience has been a little bit different. I remember when I started having enough control to internally mask, and then when I started having enough control to externally Um, and I might, you know, trip over some wording because I'm going back into memory when words were a little different than they are now and trying to like pull new terminology into the past. But when I was young, I was a kid that you could recognize had a learning disability from just at first meeting them. Um, I had some selective mutism and I, was deregulated a lot. And it was, I guess, like what they call like the cringy behavior now, like I couldn't not do it for a really, really long time. It wasn't until my teens that I started having enough control over my executive functioning makes a lot of sense. Having enough control over building up enough executive functioning um, to be able to kind of internally mask And, you know, it's based on access needs now. Back then it was like functioning labels. And I don't love that by any means, but I think that that's sometimes how neurotypical people, when they're looking from the outside in, see that is the level of masking that maybe you have control over internally and externally to some extent. I know that's not the whole story by any means, but I think that that may play a big role, at least observationally. No, I think, I, 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 I think, I think you're absolutely right. And there's also like, in order to like the self-monitoring piece of zooming out and being like, am I showing up authentically or not? Like that's actually a higher level cortical function in and of itself. Um, so no wonder if you're in burnout or, you know, you're, you, you don't have access to this. It's like, you, you, you really can't, you really can't tell you just stop functioning. I didn't grow up in a home where I had um, good social role models and I, you know, was a bit alienated. I was also an immigrant. So I was a little bit alienated at school as well. And it took me, even though I always had strong empathy, it took me a really long time to memorize kind of mathematically the social cues and facial expressions of others. And it was really tiring. So I think I couldn't mimic things for a very long time because I just couldn't for a while, I didn't even care to learn it because I didn't feel like people were taking an interest in me. So why take an interest in them? But when I finally cared to learn it, it was a built skill. It took a really long time and a mask has to be based on something, right? So if I'm not connecting with anything around me, I'm not basic. I don't have anything to base a mask on. Yeah. And I think that connection piece, I think when you know, there's all this, there's all this mythology out there, but you know, when some, when often I'll hear, you know, um, somebody talking, often talking about a child, you know, um, that child prefers to play alone, prefers to play alone. It's just not, it's not safe to play with the people who are around you. So you prefer to play alone because this is the alternative. Um, and, and as opposed to like, if there were actually somebody who would, you could like, sh- so Kelly, so it's interesting. So tell me more about that. So, w- so I still prefer to play alone. 
Um, how do you tell? How do you tell that it's preference versus I'm trying to, I'm really trying to recover from 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 the rest of my interactions. So I think I remember when I wanted to not sit alone at lunch. And the reason I wanted to not sit alone at lunch was people stared at me more when I sat alone. I really wanted to be alone. I much preferred to be alone, but that extra attention that I was getting by being alone was much more uncomfortable than just dealing with people. Now um, I still will hide <laughs> at least 15 minutes a day. And if I don't get that alone time, I deregulate. I really enjoy social connection just through writing or on the computer, but in person, like I just really don't. Um, if I was given the choice between, you know, doing something I enjoyed by myself in my room or doing something that I enjoyed with other people, nine times out of 10, I would choose my room. Absolutely. And so would I. And yeah. it's because I'm exhausted. <laughs> even when I have the choice to be around, because I'm very lucky, there are a few people in my life that really get it. And even I feel guilty sometimes, because even if I have the choice to be around them, once in a while I want to, but it's it's not, I, I'm usually just as happy on my own. Yeah. And I think that um, it's interesting because I think that when we, we we think about all the, you know, the personality dynamics, you know, introversion, extroversion, where do you get your power from? Where do you charge your battery from? I think that having, when you, when you charge your battery in alone time and you don't get it, that's an, that's a failure of an access need. And that's so, so often, um, you know, not met for people. Laura? I'm just thinking of early in my marriage. Um, my husband is, we're like best friends and we do everything together and we've been high school together since then. And um, we didn't yet know that he was autistic. And one day I found out that before he came home every day, he would park his car and go sit somewhere else before he would come home. And I was so hurt and I took it so personally until we were able to sort out that like it's nothing against you and I love my time with you but I need time where I'm not with you and that's important and I feel like understanding that was such a game changer in in our friendship beyond our relationship to say like oh it's okay that sometimes we need time where we're not together even just being in the same house he's like even if you're upstairs I'm downstairs I need to be like away from you all the way in a car somewhere Thank you for sharing that. And I think that like that, that that's where it's like how you appraise a situation really matters. So if you tell the story, like someone's trying to recover from their time with me, like that is one narrative. <laughs> Another narrative is, oh, this is a person who has an access need to charge their battery from within. Um, but again, that's, you know, there's, there's, there's all this messaging around that, you know, we're supposed to be with people all the time, Amy. Um, my husband and I are also best friends and been together. We do, we're business partners. We've done everything together. And when the burnout started, I would basically ask him like, will you please leave the house? Because I, it was the only time that I could, I could be myself and, um, one time I remember he was traveled for like a week and it was the first time in a long time I've been my, but, and I could just feel the muscles in my face by the time, like within five days that the, my muscles in my face started relaxing. And it had been the first time in years that I noticed like, oh, this is a physically affecting me, like being partnered with someone, because I think prior to being with him, I was alone all of the time. And but then I think when when autism came in and we started looking at that and I could start naming the thing with him of like what was happening for me, I started, I think initially starting to unmask in front of him. And then because there was so much curiosity from him that we could start having this dialogue and our, like our both of our special interests was like autism. And so it was like really a lot more enjoyable, but I, I still feel the physical toll, like even being around in ABB, there's, there is a physical toll to being around and even speaking. Um, so I'm trying, I'm starting to try and work that out because it doesn't necessarily feel like a mask, but there is a physicality to expressing in a particular way, a partic when you don't know people or 
and the second guessing of that. And so I just wanted to mention that part of like the physical pain that can come from masking. Absolutely. And I think that um, uh, even, I mean, thinking about the, you know, the, 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 just, I think about this as like a battery thing. Um, and, you know, like with any electronic device, like, you know, cause I never remember to charge my phone, you know, executive functioning. Um, but like today it was at 2% battery. I was like, oh, I could make a phone call or that I know how that ends. So I went and I like plugged it in and didn't make a call. Um, I mean, it was great because I hate making calls. So, so anyway, it was an excuse. But anyway, point is, in brains, it's the same thing. Um, but we don't charge our battery. We just keep doing the thing. Um, and, and, and that's how burnout happens. Um, so it's, uh, I'm just reading in the chat. Sorry, I'm uh, very much not caught up. Um, but um, I, 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 I love how active the, 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 the chat is. Uh, see, Amy, you're going to take back. Amy, Amy gave me some feedback about like how I like manage the chat and the conversation all at once. And I was like, I don't know actually that I do that at all. Um, and uh, it's actually like the hardest thing ever. And I'm exhausted. Anyway, so like, I think I, it's really ironic that like just by even bringing attention to that, I can actually no longer do it. It's really interesting. It was very, very much not intentional. Kat says the color in my house, oh, the color, right? It's, 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 it's that time. Uh, the culture in my household now includes everyone has their own personal space, their own bedroom, this, their own. We continue to have our own spaces. And I think it's, you know, it's interesting. It's like, it's like, how do you create that? I mean, so, um, you know, even, even if there's not additional like rooms to have a room, like how can you, how do you teach people to create their own space, even their own internal space? And I think that's what, I think that's what a lot of the, like the, like the withdrawing, the glazing over the retreating, like it, it's, it's a survival skill of creating space. Um, cat, uh, I'm scrolling, um, yeah, noise canceling headphones, lots of people sharing that lockdown. I was thinking about that just this morning. Um, that lockdown, you know, there's so many challenges of that lockdown time, including like, you know, people getting sick, loved ones dying from COVID, like all of this. And that that shared experience of people being um uh, of, of of going through something together. Um, there, there, there were there together while separate, and maybe for the first time meeting some sensory and communication access needs that maybe people didn't know they had. That's some people's, not everybody's experience. Um, but it's uh, it's hard when you don't know what your access needs are. But I think that beginning from a place of uh, this isn't working, what's not working, and maybe like like being able to think about what it is that's not working might help you figure out what the need is. Kim says, lockdown was what got me out of burnout because it imposed boundaries with the outside world that I could not put in place myself. And Amy says that was a big part of me coming out of burnout as well. So noticing one's mask, noticing the difference between, um, you know, and, 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 you know, rather than, you know, necessarily appraising it as like unmasking or not unmasking, but just like feeling safe. Um, and we've talked about this at Brain Club's past around how do you, how do you know versus how do you feel when it's safe? to be yourself. And I think that many people struggle to answer that question. And I think that maybe it, because I think, I think so many people have never felt that or so rarely feel that, that they I don't have, necessarily recognize it. Go ahead. I have a, like a anecdote. Like, I don't know. It's a little story. Like, um, my partner is currently the only person one of the very few people besides my children and his children or whatever that I, I don't 
that I'm not, it's like, I can't mask around him. It's weird. Cause I, I think he's autistic too, although he doesn't agree with me, but, um, and it's kind of like when we go out and do things, it's this weird experience where it's like this bubble that kind of goes with me where I'm like unmasked if he's around. So I only, I notice it a lot when like I'm doing and I'm in a social environment and I do see other people's responses to like our interactions and stuff. And it's, and that's when I realized that I am fully unmasked out and about. And it is a very odd experience um, that I didn't have before having this like particular connection ex with the exception of my children. But it's different when it's an adult versus a child because you can be kind of like goofy and silly with a child and people just think you're playing. But with another adult, it looks different. So that's just like a weird experience that I've had that I feel like finding a safe person is is kind of like really important. Yeah, I think everyone needs a safe person. And um, I, I, you know, one of one of my goals in quitting my job to start All Brains Belong is that people would find safe people here, that people would would come, um, they would find some connections, they would have the practice of showing up authentically, and that they would feel better. That was the whole point. Um, because it's very, it's like when you think about the, sh like the, the, you know, last, last month's book chat was, um, was, was about shame and, uh, and, and for all the limitations of, 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 of that book or that author or those messages, like shame is actually a thing and it's actually bad for health. And I think that, um, the isolation really drives that. Oh, I'm glad, CV. I'm glad. So as we, as we, um, oh, I'm just reading. Uh, so, so, so Laura's, Laura's saying um, we don't have enough bedrooms for everyone to have their own rooms, but, but we're, 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 but initially I viewed this as a failure that I couldn't make it work with sharing rooms, but now I realize how important it is to meeting my kids' access needs is to helping them find safety at home. And we're making things work right now. Um, even within the context of sharing rooms, right? And it's about how do you figure out what your needs are and how do, how can we be creative about how to get those needs met? Um, and there are like, you know, the there's, 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 there's like the world rules of like, I can't snap my fingers and put up a wall. And I don't like, I don't have the resources to build a wall. Like I, I it's not happening. So how do I figure out how within this same room, we're going to figure out how to get our access needs met. And how do we talk about that transparently? Or uh, Kat says, yes, meals look very different for us. Now we eat when we want to, where we want to, what we want to. Yes. Right. Just making the choice to drop that demand of of like this is the way meals are supposed to look uh because that was not working um right and uh like laura said the nostalgia and internal messaging that this was the right way to do things right it's 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 like what we talk about at brain couple a lot is unlearning those messages around this is the right way to do it kelly writes a friend has camping tents in the house for her kids that there's a camping tent most of the time in my living room. Um, they are the no no one can enter place. Um, they got them by posting on Facebook, and since she didn't need it to be watertight, she had lots of people give them two, little two three person tents. That's awesome. Oh, I love that. I love that. So as we head into, I just want to name the thing. We head into April. I'm just gonna a word on April. Um, April, for many people, whether you are new to the autistic community or not, April can be hard. April can be hard because there's like, it's autism awareness, autism acceptance month, and there's like, all the fundraisers and walkathons for Autism Speaks, they're not fundraising for All Brains Belong. They're fundraising for what many uh, autistic people consider to be a hate group. So like, this is what goes on in April. 
So what we're going to do in August, August, April, <laughs> it's really brain. April is Autistic Culture Month here at Brain Club. And I think it's going to be awesome. And next week, we will be joined by a panel of community members talking about their experience um, coming to on, uh, along their autistic journey. Um, and I'm very, very excited about this. And as we march through the month, um, there will be some, um, you know, uh, 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 some, 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 the conversations will be pretty much like our usual conversations with, with a couple of, of a couple of extras, um, like uh, in the, the second week of April, um, I'm going to be doing a reprise of last year's, I know a lot of you were, were at this last year, um, the stigma of autism. Um, and the role of the healthcare system in perpetuating that stigma. So that's going to be in in two weeks. Um, and I think I think I think it's going to be a good month. And we're going to try as you know, just 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 to remember that you know, like the range of emotions that happen in April. Um, not just because it's April, because you might see some things that are upsetting. And to just know that there's there's community here, that you are not the only one. And like, by the way, you don't need to be upset when you see things about April. Um, um, and if you are, you are not alone. Um, uh, Laura's asking, is that a brain club or a separate event? So it is going to be um, a brain club, but we're also going to be advertising it as a separate event. Um, with the with with yeah, because I mean I think that message that that message just needs to be heard. That like you know what what you know it, like people talk about you know um you know, a, 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 about inclusion and acceptance and like whatever. But if you're still considering autism through this deficit based lens, that's gross and it's really bad for health. You can totally invite nursing students. You can invite anyone. It's free. Invite the world. It'll be great. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, everybody.